Unlacing the Corset, Fashion and Freedom, an exploration of how changes in women's clothing, especially the corset, reflected changes in women's roles. Welcome to Unlacing the Corset, Fashion and Freedom. I'm Julie Huffman Klinkowitz, the Collections Manager and Curator at the Cedar Falls Historical Society. And I'm Chris Lorenz. I'm a retired instructor from Hawkeye Community College where I taught fashion merchandising management and a course in history of costume. This presentation is in conjunction with our 2020 exhibit, The Fight for the Right, Women and the Vote. The first Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. The women involved were fighting for many rights. Among them were the right to vote and legal and social rights. Society strongly opposed women stepping out of their traditional roles of wife and mother. Dress placed subtle psychological and obvious physical restrictions on women. The examples on the right date from the 1840s. This time, all clothing for the family was made either by a tailor, a dressmaker, or at home. There were no factories, and the sewing machine had just been invented in 1846, so everything was still made by hand. Eventually, new and improved models of the lock stitch sewing machine influenced clothing construction, but most families still couldn't afford the sewing machine. Some factories purchased machines and were able to increase their production, but this first happened in menswear long before it happened for women's wear. Corsets were worn from the mid 1500s onwards with changes only to their length and construction. The job of the corset was to mold the wearer's body into the desired shape to be inserted into the latest fashions. Fashion sent an unspoken message about one's economic and social status, virtue and mental state. Conformity in fashion reinforced conformity in life, which further restricted women's roles. As seen in the advertisements to the right, corsets were promoted for women, children, and even men. There were no standard sizes yet. The corset simply determined a woman's silhouette. There also were no full-size patterns available until Butterick introduced patterns in 1863. Fashion changed much more slowly than today gradually influenced by magazines such as Godey's Ladies Book and Peterson's magazines and advertisements as you see here. While the top half of a woman's body was forced into the corset, the bottom half was camouflaged beneath multiple layers of cloth. As skirts grew in size between 1840 and 1870, women were forced to add layers of petticoats to support them. By 1856, skirts could weigh up to 14 pounds in addition to the weight of the dress. The petticoats pictured on the right show the changes in shape and size of the skirts they supported. Petticoats were also an important aspect of the fashion silhouette. Most used lots of layers of fabric using natural fibers such as linen, wool, silk, or cotton. The cage crinoline was patented in 1856. It was formed of steel wires covered in cloth and it was an innovation. It was lightweight compared to the layers of petticoats women were accustomed to wearing. It was also dangerous. Sparks from candles or fireplaces ignited the huge skirts, trapping their wearer in a column of flame. No one dared come close enough to put the flames out for fear their own skirts would catch on fire. Skirts could become entangled in carriage wheels and women might even be blown over in a strong wind. The photos on the right show the cage crinoline with and without a crinoline cover. Early hoops could also be made of cane or whalebone and then covered in cloth. They could be dome or cone shaped, but often skewed with fullness concentrated in the back, as you see here. Also, fewer layers of petticoats helped reduce laundry for women or their housekeepers who had to do the laundry. 
Plus, if a hoop flipped up, it could reveal a lady's legs. Totally inappropriate and scandalous for any proper woman of the day. Fashion could be hazardous to the health. Doctors warned of the damage caused by wearing corsets to internal organs and the muscular skeletal system. Long dresses with voluminous skirts and trains picked up dirt and disease and the filth of the streets. Women's rights advocates felt that freedom in dress would lead to other freedoms they sought. But tight-laced above and caged below, most women willingly followed the dictates of fashion. This 1884 drawing shows the effects on internal organs from wearing the corset. There are even stories of women having some ribs surgically removed to make their waist even smaller. Can you imagine? Women changed their clothes many times a day as there were specialized outfits or costumes for every event, time of day, occasion, or anything else. Elizabeth Smith Miller, cousin of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, first wore a modified version of the Turkish shalwa kameez, which consisted of pants and a tunic. She had seen the costume while visiting spas on her honeymoon. Amelia Bloomer wore the costume and endorsed it in her women's rights newspaper, The Lily, forever linking her name with the costume. Her endorsement of the costume in her newspaper caused subscriptions to soar and others soon began wearing the dress. The backlash was immediate and fierce. Most women who wore the costume were ridiculed in print and in public. Husbands were told to control their wives and children begged their mothers to return to normal dress. Do you know about the Iowa connection for Amelia Bloomer? She was born in New York State in 1818, but later she and her husband moved to Council Bluffs, Iowa in 1855. There they helped establish the public schools and the library. She died in 1894 and they're both buried in Council Bluffs. The wearing of the Bloomer costume was said to lead to smoking, drinking, and gambling. In other words, male occupations. Rights advocates soon felt that the notoriety of the dress was undermining their more important goals. Most women returned to wearing the fashions of the time, corset, hoop, bustle. Susan B. Anthony accurately predicted that women can never compete successfully with men in the various industrial avocations in long skirts. To the right are examples of dresses from the 1850s through the 1880s. The controversial bloomers were actually a short-lived style of only two years or so, but they helped inspire beach attire of the 1860s and bicycling costumes of the 1880s. Plus, it was the first time in Western history that respectable women could wear divided leg coverings in public, a practice formerly reserved only for men. But times were changing, with fitness and sport propelling many of the changes. Tennis was invented in the 1860s. Women embraced the sport, but were initially viewed as mere ornaments whose job it was to coo at men's prowess. Around 1884, costumes for specific sports started to be promoted. Boating, shooting, fishing, archery, and cycling. Some were strikingly similar to the bloomer costume. The new woman emerged. She was active, outspoken, independent, and educated. She chafed against male-imposed roles of the preceding generations. Clothing design began to embrace the concept that form followed function. This period brought about the beginning of sportswear as we know it. Each sporting activity had a specific costume, as shown in these pictures. Skirts were slightly shorter, bustles became smaller, and for the first time, knit fabrics were used in clothing. Corsets were still worn, except for very active sports, and there was certainly no such thing as the sports bra. In the 1890s, ready-to-wear became more available as women entered the workplace and had less time to sew. Fashion changed quickly, fueled by advertising and marketing. Working women embraced separates and serviceable clothing. 
In addition to comfortable clothing for exercise, lightweight, loose-fitting undergarments were promoted as beneficial to health. Technological advances in industrial clothing production influenced changes in clothing construction. Growing factories and department stores made store-bought clothing more possible and available. Ready-to-wear had been available for men's and children's clothing earlier, but not for women's because the fit of women's wear was so important. Standard sizing had been finally developed for men's wear because of the need for uniforms during the Civil War. Hook and eye closures had been around for a long time, but snap fasteners weren't available and first appeared in 1897. Women's lives were changing. Women were shooting, boxing, swimming, fencing, ice skating, driving, golfing, flying, and aeroplane swimming. A new category of sportswear led to separates. This was clothing that is less formal and consisted of separate pieces to buy that you could mix and match, not necessarily a whole outfit of matching pieces. And also department stores led to shopping as a pastime, which we still do today. But the corset held on. Dresses in the 1910 to 1918 period were narrow, often with built-in boning at the waist. As the decade waned, a tubular silhouette became popular. Mechanization brought the opportunity for free time. Sports and leisure activities demanded suitable clothing. In 1925, the Women's Institute of Domestic Arts stated that the modern woman's active, busy life make necessary the wearing of outer and undergarments that permit of a full enjoyment of both her pleasures and duties. Fabrics were lighter weight with less emphasis on the waist. In addition to the straight tubular shape, there were lots of novelty shapes, the lampshade dress, the hobble skirt, trains on skirts, draped skirts, etc. Women were working in offices, shops, as teachers, etc., and needed more practical clothing, like shirtwaist blouses and skirts. The corset just wasn't practical. The 1920s brought emancipation like nothing any woman had ever experienced before. Jazz music, speakeasies, dancing the Charleston, and the right to vote. Dresses had a straight up and down silhouette and were constructed in one piece with no waistline or a dropped waist. Suddenly, women in corsets were très passé, out of style, a thing of the past. Or were they? We hope you've enjoyed the presentation today on fashion and freedom. And we hope that you'll come and see the exhibit here at the Cedar Falls Historical Society. This exhibit will be up through the middle of December.